Your eye's retinas are formed from brain tissue and are an intimate part of your central nervous system. This could be the first common brain-machine interface connection to our brains for most people. We've all seen videos about AR or augmented reality headsets or glasses where you walk down the street and floating information is superimposed on things. Here's a clip showing a tourist using AR to navigate. You can still plainly see what's going on around you, and you're far less likely to walk into oncoming traffic. For example, let's say you're walking through your city's Chinatown. Say you don't know what the signs say, but you read it easily since every single sign has a translation into your primary language superimposed on it. It's almost like being in a Star Trek episode with a universal translator. Take that a step further. We've now got bionic lenses that can be placed inside your eye in under an hour, eight minutes actually, just like cataract surgery. These lenses integrate so well with your eye muscles that you focus three times better than 2020. Your visual resolution will be sufficient to read a menu posted in the window of a restaurant across the street. If you get a splinter in your finger and you focus too closely, you will probably see the cellular damage surrounding the log that's embedded in your fingertip. This is approaching reality now, actual human use as clinical trials begin. Now the last step, the bionic lens technology is designed as a future platform to change out the lens with nanotech replacements that give you the same supervision, but also receive signals and produce those AR images for you. No bulky headsets or Google Apple glasses required. One possibility is that they will have such minuscule power demands that they will be able to use your own body's energy system for power, so no batteries or additional wiring. Naturally, since this is rather forward-thinking, Elon Musk is involved, and though he doesn't have an executive title, he owns the majority share of Neuralink. What is Neuralink? It's a research project that is developing brain implants that can become part of your brain tissue and link with your neurons. Why would anyone want that? Ask a paraplegic who went overseas to fight and came home paralyzed. Ask a child born without a limb who will someday operate an artificial limb replacement with their mind, the same way you operate your own limbs. Stephen Hawking or Christopher Reeve would have volunteered in an instant to develop the ability to control a body that had seemingly betrayed them. And there are hundreds of thousands still with us who are in exactly the same position. An artificial spinal cord is basically 2,048 or 3,072 ultra-fine wires in a bundle smaller than the diameter of a pencil. By slipping this into the jugular vein and navigating it to the top of the brain, its electrical dendrites can connect to the motor cortex of the brain, allowing signals that still exist in the brain to bypass damaged portions of the spine. If you think about moving your hand, the signal is created even if it's not connected to anything. Using an ASIC or application-specific IC as a brainwave interpreter, the patterns can be recorded or recognized and then utilized to make the events actually happen. When the correct brain pattern appears, the ASIC sends the appropriate signal and a hand closes, an arm rises, and someone regains their independence. This is how a macaque monkey learned to play Pong, the old 8-bit computer game using only his mind. With twin Neuralink BMIs implanted, one on each side of his brain, he made the perfect study subject. He played his favorite game, Pong, as usual, for a food reward using a joystick. The researchers recorded what his mind was doing when his hand moved. After they had a library of brainwave recordings with his actions, the joystick was disconnected. He still moved it, though it did nothing, and they used his brain signals to direct the Pong paddle. He played perfectly just by thinking what he wanted to happen. Using a Neuralink powered by an ASIC, human brain patterns can be recorded to perform the same purpose. Granted, it's not leaping out of a wheelchair and walking to the store on the first day, but it is significant, and earned Neuralink an FDA approval for testing their breakthrough device on human subjects. Paraplegics ought to be able to control a mouse or keyboard just by thinking about what they wanted to do. As the technology improves, a paralyzed subject can regain motor control. The artificial spinal cord will eventually be interfaced with the nerves that control the arms, legs, core support muscles, 
sphincters, bladders, hands, fingers, feet, and toes. We already know how to apply a current to a nerve and see which muscle reacts to it. It's just a matter of making thousands of connections. Of course, as far as the brain is concerned, that's not in the realm of things humans can do yet. Most neurologists working with human patients only work with 50 to 300 electrodes. 3,000 connections without damaging tissue would be near impossible for them. Neuralink, however, has a machine, an autonomous robotic neurosurgeon, which can do it vastly quicker than a whole team of surgeons could accomplish the same task. It has already been used on a pig in that amazing monkey and can place nearly 200 electrodes per minute, theoretically placing 3,072 in about a quarter of an hour. A remarkably fast time for brain surgery. It is so precise that damage is negligible. Future versions, according to Musk, would be self-deploying, shunted through the carotid artery and then extending into the brain tissue. There would be no need to open the skull at all, eliminating a potential route for infection. Elsewhere in the body, it seems likely that placing them in the corresponding nerves will be up to human surgeons. They'll determine which nerve bundles send signals to the desired place so they can make appropriate connections, but likely not with wires that go all the way to the brain. Instead, the artificial spinal cord could be connected to a Bluetooth-like hub closer to the head and send signals to receiver units elsewhere in the body. Wires seem needlessly vulnerable to wear and tear, damage, and they're a bit old-fashioned too. Radio signals don't wear out. Musk is, some might say overly, concerned about the singularity. This is the theoretical point where an artificial intelligence will exceed the reasoning and creative abilities of its human progenitors, resulting in the extinction of the human race, he claims. His notion is to make sure that humans are connected to the system so that the humans and AI can move forward cooperatively, integrated into an inseparable whole. He contends that otherwise the AI won't care about humans, comparing the situation of a road construction crew versus an anthill. It's not hatred or murderous intent, but rather humans or the anthill being inconsequential to the superior intelligence of the AI. The robot character Bender from the adult TV cartoon series Futurama was known for animus toward the human race. He has become his own internet meme. But would this ever really happen? One of science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke's famous laws posits that when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Public figures like Musk and Stephen Hawking were worried about humanity's future at the robot hands of a more powerful AI, but both lacked expertise in the subject. Being wealthy or being an indisputable mathematical genius does not equate automatically to scientific messiah. Computer engineers and experts such as John Holland, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, Jaron Lanier, inventor of VR, Jeff Hawkins, inventor of handheld computers, and even Gordon Moore, who is credited with the origin of Moore's Law, have spoken against the idea. It would take more computing power than the whole planet can currently muster to make that powerful an AI. After Moore's Law began to fail, that told us that we're reaching our computing limits. The laws of physics are telling us we can't go much smaller without serious consequences. CPUs are necessarily getting bigger to increase computing power, meaning the speed of light is now becoming a limiting factor for chip speed and they're getting hotter as a result. We've now reached the level where quantum effects cause miscommunication and errors as electrons jump insulating gaps smaller than a couple of nanometers. It took the largest, most powerful supercomputer on the planet using 37 million CPU cores running on 95,000 parallel computers in 9 petabytes of memory to emulate a neural net that was about a tenth of the processing capability of a human brain for a single task. Compared to a human brain, its interconnectivity was minuscule, so it couldn't engage in complex associational tasks. This supercomputer took megawatts of power to operate and couldn't achieve what your 12.6 watts of brain power can do. It needed the infrastructure of a city's power grid, 
thousands and thousands of liters of water, and huge cooling plants to emulate a simple, single function of a real brain. You could perform orders of magnitude better than the supercomputer by eating a sandwich. In fact, your entire body, the infrastructure to support your marvelous brain, only uses about 4 grams or 4 fifths of a teaspoon of sugar to run for an hour. It also explains why so many of us are overweight, when a single can of soda pop has 10-15 to 15 hour supply of sugar energy in it, but that's a different story. Now, everyone who has seen a movie like Ready Player One or Ryan Reynolds' Free Guy will know how much the general population is looking forward to something with that level of perceived reality. Maybe it will be a holodeck affair like Star Trek, but that technology seems out of reach for a long time yet. There have been many more movies, such as the Matrix series, the original 1990 Total Recall, and several TV shows such as Caprica, Altered Carbon, and Reverie, all exploring what VR would be like. It's fantasy taken to the nth level, and it seems much more likely that we will be able to create an immersive environment using our own brains than trying to create real holographic solids to interact with. One human brain has more computing power than any existing computer, so we'll likely exploit what we have naturally. With BMIs, we can download a framework into a chip we have built in, the sandbox of a game, and then just load ancillary data to make the simulation run. We're already experts at running games with cells and LOD or level of detail managers that fill in generic, distant mountains rather than rendering every blade of grass in the VR world, most of which you'll never see. LODs don't tell you about players in adjacent cells unless you need to know that. They render a distant player as a red or blue blob when they're distant and fill in the details as you get closer. It makes MMORPGs possible and reduces computing overhead. To be functional, ARs and VRs would likely use a similar strategy through the BMIs to economize on information transfer. How would it be if the experience could be entirely within a pseudo-reality that could not be differentiated from reality? You could be a supervillain trying to kill millions of NPCs or non-player characters, or the hero trying to save them from almost certain doom. Players could fight each other for points, fame, or bonuses as we do in current games, but it would feel real. Right now, we rely on devices such as small circular platforms that allow you to walk in any direction without leaving the space you're in. Some you can sit in as if you're riding a motorcycle or driving a car. Adam Savage of Mythbusters fame in his mid-50s uses a VR simulation as his physical workout to stay healthy. He made himself some solid metal lightsaber hilts to enhance the realism of a game called Beat Saber. Watch this guy stay in shape and stay healthy. But if we could do it all within our minds, by using BMI interfaces to display only what we need in the immediate area to fool our senses, we could accomplish anything, and probably everyone would participate. You wouldn't need to go to Paris. You could experience it virtually. It might even be that you'd hire someone in Paris to wander around as a surrogate for you. Or it might be a business for people to do that and sell the experience to a virtual tourist who would download what the surrogate experienced as they tasted coffee in a sidewalk cafe, or walked through the Louvre, or felt the wind on their face at the top of the Eiffel Tower. The technology is coming. It might be through jacking in as described in older SF when people thought you might need a physically wired connection in the back of your skull. It might be through a Bluetooth-style connection, because that's obviously better. Whichever it is, people and researchers are interested enough to figure out the methodology for fooling our brains into believing these scenarios for at least a little while. With coming automation, we're going to have a lot more leisure time in the future. Challenging games and activities are going to have a big role in entertaining us we probably won't have to fend off Skynet, but it might be entertaining to try as a simulation. I'll take the T-3000, please. If you found this video insightful, go ahead and leave us a like and subscribe to the channel if you think that we have earned it. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.